Section 19 contains another special witness of Christ, but this time given to Martin Harris. Section 19 was received during the time that the Book of Mormon was at the printer being printed, and it may have come in the summer of 1829 or early in the winter of 1830. The point was, Martin Harris was nervous about the book being printed. The person that they had contracted to print the book, E.B. Grandin, was very, very sticky about the requirements. E.B. Grandin refused to print any copies until he was paid up front in advance in full, and this involved a considerable amount of money. Martin was going to have to sell his farm in order to pay for this. But it also seems like after these financial concerns on the surface, there were deeper concerns lingering in Martin's mind about his eternal welfare, especially after the loss of the manuscript. Because the first thing that the Lord addresses in Martin's revelation isn't money, it's hell. It seems like Martin was really, really nervous that because of the things that he'd done in the past and the role that he may have played in losing the original manuscript of the Book of Mormon, he was going to end up in endless torment. Now, endless torment doesn't sound like a lot of fun. That's a phrase that doesn't appear in the Bible, but it appears seven times in the Book of Mormon, and just the words endless and torment are enough to send a chill down your spine. So Martin wanted to know exactly what endless torment meant, and the Savior was willing to provide him with an answer. What the Savior taught Martin was that endless torment is not endless. The Lord said, I am endless, and the punishment which is given from my hand is endless punishment, for endless is my name. Wherefore, eternal punishment is God's punishment, and endless punishment is God's punishment. In other words, God isn't the sort of person that's interested in punishing people eternally or endlessly. It's called endless punishment because that's his name, but there is an end to it. The way James E. Talmadge explained this was he said, to hell there is an exit as well as an entrance. No man will be kept in hell longer than is necessary to bring him to a fitness for something better. When he reaches that stage, the prison doors will open and there will be rejoicing among the hosts of heaven to welcome him into a better state. And once the Savior had cleared up that Martin wasn't going to go into endless torment regardless of what he did, the Savior then tried to convince Martin to repent by sharing a little bit about his history. A lot of us are familiar with this picture. It's in just about every chapel owned by the church. It shows Jesus Christ in Gethsemane, and it shows a man in a white robe kneeling down and sharing a dignified prayer. Now, this image is strictly conjecture, because in the Bible, there is no first-hand account of what happens in Gethsemane. Other than Jesus Christ and an angel that appeared to him, there were no witnesses of what happened in Gethsemane. The three witnesses that Christ chose, Peter, James, and John, all came into Gethsemane and then fell asleep and didn't actually witness the Savior suffering in the garden. In fact, the only first-hand account of the Savior suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane that we have isn't found in the Bible. It's found in the Doctrine and Covenants. And it was shared by the Savior to help convince Martin Harris of the need for him to repent. The Savior earnestly pleaded with him, saying, For behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I, which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain, and to bleed at every pore, and to suffer both body and spirit, and would that I might not drink the bitter cup and shrink. Nevertheless, glory be to the Father, and I partook and finished my preparations unto the children of men. Now, Martin was convinced to repent, and he did mortgage his farm, and we owe Martin a huge debt for financing the printing of the Book of Mormon. 5,000 copies were printed, and Martin became one of the most successful and ardent missionaries of the Book of Mormon. He not only shared the Book of Mormon with people, he believed deeply in what the Book of Mormon taught. One outside observer of the church said, Harris was a proverbially peaceful man, as well as an honest man. He was slow to retaliate an offense. When urging the sale of the book with a pertinacious confidence in the genuineness of the Smith revelation, he fell into a debate about its character with a neighbor of an irascible temperament. His opponent became angry and struck him, Martin Harris, with a severe blow upon the right of his face. Instantly turning towards the assailant the other cheek, Martin quoted the Christian maxim, read from the Book of Mormon, it's also found in the Gospel of Matthew, that whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. So all three, David, Oliver, and Martin, sought the Lord. Some of them received a commission to go forth. Some of them received a commission to sacrifice financially. But all of them gave, and all of them became special witnesses of Christ, and in a unique sense, apostles in every sense of the word.